right, good morning up here, church. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are excited. I'm excited. It's Baptism Sunday. It's hard not to be excited when you're talking about baptisms, and it's it's so huge, and it's it's awesome. And uh, to think about every time we do baptisms, I relive our first baptism uh, at Up of Church, and I know that I've started this uh, with you with some of you before, and probably all of you, but um, our first baptism was in our basement, and we baptized um, these four kids. One of them was uh, our oldest girl in a cattle trough and uh, didn't know what to use. And um, my dad gave me this little propane heater that would heat the water so that way I could use it. But it does a gallon an hour. And I thought, I don't have enough time. So I used this little five-gallon, or as a gallon, a little gallon bucket, put it in the sink and fill it with hot water. And I had four stove eyes, and I was boiling water to get it warm enough and making all these trips. So it took an hour and a half to fill up this cattle trough, but it was huge. And the thing that where we've come from since then has been absolutely amazing what, uh, what God has done. And it's very powerful. It's very powerful. And the whole reason why all this is so powerful is because of the rock-solid foundation on which it stands. And we've been talking about this foundation, and that's why concrete is, is such a neat tool because uh, it hardens, and you can build on it. Our houses are laid with concrete foundations. We, we need concrete. We have concrete driveways. We see concrete sidewalks. And the reason why is because it stands up and it, you can walk on it. It will hold up to the weather. It will hold up to the abuse. And your entire house, your entire structure can be built on a solid foundation. And that's what we talked about last week, that one of the truths that is so foundational for your life is what you believe. Because what you believe is what you're going to do. And that goes for every question you are ever ask. That goes for every action you've ever done. Whatever you believe is what you're going to do. But there's also, the part is, is that just because you believe something doesn't mean it is true. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you all to give me the answer. What color is the sky? Well, what if I believe it's red? Does that mean that I'm wrong? Yes, it does. It does. And the whole point is that just because you say something, just because you may believe that way, doesn't make it true. That just because you just think something up, some of you may say, well, I believe in aliens. And if you do, that's okay. But we not have any evidence of it, and I don't believe it's true. Now, you saw, maybe you saw on Facebook this past week, or I think it was the week before, somebody put out that there is a Bigfoot running loose through High Knob, Scott County. You may believe in Bigfoot. Um, no. Um, they made TV shows and everything searching for Bigfoot, but they've never found him. But just because you think this stuff up doesn't mean it is true. So we can believe all we want to, but where do we actually go to get our truth from? Now, some of you have people you run to. You may run to your parents. You may run to friends and ask them, you know, what to do about this situation. But there is one place, one place above all others that we should run to for any source of information, for our very first step of guidance. The first thing we should run to. And that is the Bible. Now, the Bible is awesome and I know that Tony gives me a hard time and David Smith and even my own kids do because every week I say this is my favorite scripture it's only because I really like the Bible it's full of suspense it's full of drama it's full of people people's problems and their issues and how God comes in and just takes care of things I mean there's a guy in the Bible that we read that he prayed fire down from heaven he had a pet bird that brought him food I mean it's in the Bible it's that's awesome I want a pet bird that will bring me food it's in the Bible. We can see how God led the Israelites across the Red Sea, and it's all in the Bible. We like Noah's Ark and the flood and all that stuff, and we get that from the Bible. All the miracles that Jesus has done, it's, it's in the Bible. But most of the time, our Bibles sit on our coffee table or end tables, and they collect dust, and we don't search them. Amazing riches, amazing truth. God, it's for your life is found in the Bible, this is why the Bible is foundational for your life. Because you can believe anything you want to, but you had better be able to back it up. You believe in Bigfoot? Great. You need to prove it to me. 
You believe in such and such, great, you need to be able to back that up. And we need to take everything that we believe and back it up from the Bible. Now, the Bible speaks very clearly on this. Jesus said it, and we're going to read it again. This is Matthew chapter 7. This is the, very powerful because the Bible is foundational for everything that, you, everything that you stand on. should come from truth, and that is the Bible. And this is so powerful statement because this is what Jesus is speaking about you and your life. The Bible. And in Matthew chapter 7, he says this, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. Verse 26, But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So what he's saying is, is that the Bible is important. It's the word of God. He says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be wise. And the Bible comes in all different shapes and, and forms. So this one's a little bit bigger. My wife actually bought this one for me. Uh, this one, she bought it for me in 2003 whenever uh, God was really getting after me and really want all of my life. And uh, I gave it to him and she bought me this. And uh, she even had my name put on it. It says Patrick Johnson. That's my real name, by the way. It's Patrick Johnson, not PJ, but everybody calls me PJ. That was my mom you just heard because she refuses to call me. PJ. There's all different kinds of Bibles. And one of the reasons why people do not look for the Bible is because they say they don't understand it. So I'm going to show you a Bible that anyone can understand. It's one of my favorite Bibles. We do it all the time at the house. This is actually Caleb Bug's Bible. She's five years old. This is her Bible. And what makes this Bible so amazing is it has pictures. Now, I've taken this Bible and I have lined it up with this Bible, which is my, this is my King James Bible, and the stories in this Bible are accurate in this Bible. Now, is that not amazing? So I, it doesn't matter where your Bible, just get in God's Word because of what He says. That if we get in God's Word and do what He says, we are wise. I don't be known as a foolish man, building a house upon sand. I want to be, I want to be wise wise and he says here's how you can be wise read the bible and do what it says read the bible and do what it says you want the key to the success in your life read the bible and do what it says now understand this that success doesn't mean it's going to be easy it means that you're following god's plan for your life because there's nothing about life that is easy but man when we can search out the bible we're going to find truths we're going to find guidance in your life you don't know how to deal with the people in your life man we can get guidance in here you don't know what to do when somebody has done your wrong and done your own. Jesus says in his word, he says you need to forgive them seven times. It's like, how many seven times? No, seven times 70. Forgive. We just need to do this. It's amazing. Seven times, seven, 490 times we can forgive somebody. And he says, that's not even a number. You keep going, going. You want to know about the future? Because the Bible talks about the future and what happens. Because soon... Jesus is coming back, and he's doing, the church is going to be raptured out. And I wonder how many of us are ready and looking for his return. We find that in the Bible. I love this Bible. We do this at supper time. Usually, uh, me or Elian is the first ones that get done, and they say, is it Bible time? And while they're finishing eating, and so what I do is that we'll go through the Bible. We start from the beginning and go all the way to the end, and we go through it. And I, I paraphrase it, and I don't read it word for word to them, uh, and I show them the pictures. You know, if this is not good enough for you, at the Bible store, guess what they have? A pop-up. You can get the Bible in a pop-up. You just open it up and... Now, what's not cool about that? Pop-ups. They got a pop-up Bible. Now, granted, it's only got like 12 stories in it, but it's a, it's a pop-up. I even like saying that. Pop-up. There's different translations. You got up here, I've got King James, I've got the, this is the CSB, this one is the NIV, and this one is the NLT. And if you have your Bible like I do on my iPad, you've got numerous different translations. And I'm going to tell you something, not many people will tell you. Just find one that speaks to you and read it. Just get in God's Word. Just get in it. 
I like the NLT. There's another one that's really good. It's called the God's Word Translation. It's really good. Just get in it. Just open it up. Because, man, when you do, God's Word will come alive. The whole reason we're practicing baptisms is, guess why? It's in the Bible. We see it, so many things are in the Bible. So everything that we believe ought to come from the Bible. But for some reason, we don't seek to it. And I think there's a couple of reasons why. And one of those is, is because we are confused about who actually wrote the Bible. Who actually wrote it. We look at the Bible and we see these faults and failures of men. But there's only one author of the Bible. Now, this is amazing. This is uh, very important. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Because if we were to look through the Bible, we're going to see that Matthew wrote some. We're going to see that some priests wrote some. We're going to see that some kings and things, they wrote some in the Bible. But there is only one author in the Bible. And he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. And teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Now this is powerful. Because what God is saying is, is that he wrote the Bible. He has a purpose for the Bible. To lead and guide and direct your every action. What you believe, how you raise your family, how you treat your friends, how you do at work. Everything is in the Bible. And so when somebody comes and they tell me, well I would read the Bible but it's boring. They're lying. Because there is nothing boring about it. But they, I can read all the suspense books and all this. And, and I like to read murder books. The Bible is full of murder. Yeah, I like to read war books about war. Do you know how much war is in the Old Testament? It's all war. We see about a 12-year-old boy who took out this unbelievable soldier. It's all in there. And God wrote it for your sake. To equip you in your life. To equip you. To give you the necessary tools that you need to go through life and be all you can be. So who wrote the Bible? God did. God wrote the Bible. And if God wrote the Bible, shouldn't that make us more attentive? Shouldn't that be so powerful to know that God who created you even wrote an instruction manual for us to live by? Now we're men, men and some women are the same way. When you go and you buy something, and it has instructions to put it together. You probably do the same thing that I do. I don't need that. And you put it aside. And then you start assembling. Three hours later, you're looking for screws and thinking, I don't know how this goes here. And then what do you do? You go back to the instruction manual. The Bible is our perfect instruction manual. And we need to go to it every time. This is why it's so vital that you look to the Bible for guidance in your life. The Bible. The Bible. It's not just some old book. It's not something that your parents just told you to take care of. It's amazing and it's written by God. And because it's written by God, every word is true. Every word. God wrote it and it is true. Look at Second Peter. This is Second Peter chapter 1. And here is proof. This is Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. He says, Above all. All, above all, above everything else, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, these prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. Now this is powerful because what he's saying is, is that, yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we see that Paul had a part in this. We see that Samuel wrote some of this. We see that Moses wrote some of it, but they were inspired by God. It was God working through the power of His Holy Spirit, guiding them as they penned the words down. It's God's Word. And every word is true. Every word. For God cannot lie. He is perfect. Now, if God is perfect and He is truth, does that mean that everything contained in Scriptures is truth, even though it was written by men? Yes. Because God inspired it. It's God's word. Every bit of it is God's word. Now, I like to make the Bible come alive. And uh, I guess that's why I get uh, so excited about it. And so when we're sitting down um, at supper time and we're going, you know, we're going through the Bible and I show these pictures and all that, 
and I'll turn to this story and I'll make it come alive, you know, to my girls. And, uh, and here I'm, I'm showing these, I'm showing these pictures, and I remember doing this a while back, Joshua and the spies, because these spies they went out and stayed at a prostitute's house, and so I'm trying to relay this to my girls about a prostitute and what they do for income. We have lively discussion at the Johnson house at supper time. <laughs> We have amazing discussions, and even when it comes to uh, Noah's Ark, when we were talking about Noah's Ark, and it never dawned on me until a while back, and here he was, we're going through Noah's Ark, and talking about the story, and we're talking about how Noah saved eight people, you know, through the Ark, and all the animals, and here we are sitting at supper time, and it's all good, and then we said, and God killed everybody else. So my five-year-old starts asking questions. You mean everybody died? Yes. So she took this to bed with her, and she was asking, is there going to be another flood? Because we need to build a boat. Because I don't, she said, I don't want to die, you know. It makes, it makes you think, but the whole point of it is, is getting in God's word. It's true. It, it's true. We can even go and find scientific evidence that backs up the flood, a reason why they had an ice age. We can find scientific evidence if they've even found certain artifacts. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some things that they've never found. They've never found the Ark of the Covenant. They've never found Noah's Ark. And I can't but believe that God hid those because they would be used as idols. And people would idolize these artifacts instead of their maker, who is God. See, it's all about God. And God's Word is all about God. How he created everything and his master plan and even his future plan. Because he has a plan and a future for you. The Bible is amazing. It's so powerful. And now we know that it is true. Even though that men pinned it down, every bit of it is true. So if every bit of the Bible is true, everything it says about Jesus is true. His coming, his birth. His heritage, his genealogy, all the miracles that he done, how he turned water into wine, how he walked on water. I love that because I want to walk on water so bad, and I would love to step into this and be able to do that, but I know it's not going to happen because I've done the experiment many times and I failed. It's true. We see how Jesus healed the blind. How he made the, even the dead come back to life. We see how Jesus healed a lame man. Because his friends had enough faith to open up the roof of some stranger's house and lower him down. There's a girl, a little girl, 12 years old, and she died. And Jesus brought her back to life. Jesus had a friend who died, Lazarus, and he laid in the grave for four days, decaying, and Jesus called him out. The Bible is true. And if the Bible is true, everything about Jesus is true, and therefore Jesus is coming back. Therefore there is a heaven and there is a hell. Therefore Satan is real. The Bible is true. Every word is true. When you look at history, there's so many things that support it. Now, you have a choice to make when it comes to the Bible. And I'm talking about the Bible, whichever version you want. But you have a choice to make when it comes to the Bible. And you only have one of two choices. And you can either accept it or you can reject it. You can either accept the Bible or you can reject it. And many people have rejected the Bible. And if we reject the Bible, we're rejecting God. This is Romans 1.20. This is Paul when he says this. He said, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. He's saying, even if you reject God's word, even nature itself should show you there is a God. Me and Amanda, we went hiking this past Friday. It was amazing. We hiked to this waterfall. It was beautiful, and it had these different tiers on it. And you could just see just the power of the force of this water and how amazing it was. And there was a perfect creator that created this. This is a part of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And as we was hiking through there, you could see the beauty of all these mountains. And the whole time walking th through there, you could hear 
that water as it went on down the valley. You could hear that. And I couldn't help but think, as seeing all this beauty, and yet there's people who say there is no God. And I wonder on the other side of that, if God sometimes looks down and see us and our activities, thinking, wow, they're, they're missing it. They're enjoying all my creation. They're going skiing and canoeing and vacation at the beach, but yet they have no relationship with me. And I tell them in my word that I created everything. God's word is true. And even if we reject it, creation itself to tell you there is a God. And his name is God. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you and give you life. Every word is true. So God wrote the Bible. And since God wrote the Bible, every word is true. And if you reject the Bible, nature itself still will tell you that there is a God. But there's also a caution because some people still reject it. This is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he says this about some people that only act religious. They put on a show. This is 2 Timothy 3, 5. And he says, They will act religious, but some, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Stay away from people who are fakers, who just pretend to be it. Pretend. He said, listen, if you are real, if you are authentic, if you are the real deal, then you need to search the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. You may have a, a favorite football team that you that you like and you you love this team you've got the jerseys you've got the car paint I mean you are all about this football team but that doesn't make you on the team just because you have all this stuff and know all this stuff you can know all the facts you want to know about all their coaches and the stats of their players but it doesn't make you on the team and that's what he's saying here that just because we are claiming something doesn't mean that we are. We do it by our actions. And our actions are based upon what we believe. See how this comes full circle? That what you believe will prove, what you believe will prove through your actions. What you believe doesn't necessarily have to be told. It will be shown by your actions. Your actions. I remember asking my dad, I was like, we had a 1995 silver Ford Taurus. It was pretty and it was silver and it had silver interior. It was all silver. And dad would drive this and he would usually drop me and my brother off at school. Uh, on the way at Nichols Elementary and then we'd ride a bus to Twin Springs and we had this car. And this one morning I was, was going... And I remember it well because Dad always had this one particular coffee cup and asked me to hold it because it wouldn't fit in the coffee cup holder. So I had to hold it, and it spilled on me. And he always listened to this one particular radio preacher every morning. I don't even remember the name of it, but it was a trucker guy who spoke to truckers. And that's it, Mace Jackson. That's it, that. Mace Jackson. He listens every morning. And this one particular morning, he was talking about being what you are. And I asked Dad, I said, Dad, we got this nice silver car. You listen to this program, you're a preacher. Why don't you put something like that, like custom plates that says something like Preacher Pat or Brother Pat. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, you shouldn't have to tell people what you are. You show them what you are. Wow. That means you can tell people all you want to, that you love God and you're a Christian, but your actions will prove it. And where do we get our information for our actions? Church, you get it from nowhere else but the Bible. Everything you do, the way you lead your family, the way you live your life should be backed up by the Bible. The Bible. Now, I'm spending so much time talking about the Bible because it's so foundational for your life. So foundational. So then how do we get this? How did it come from God to this? Now, I'm going to kind of go through this sort of fast, and I know there's going to be some facts for you, but I want to show you how God did it, how God did it, and how we physically have a Bible, how we physically came to have the Bible. So the Bible, what we call the Bible, is actually made up of 66 books, made up of by 60 authors, or 40 authors from the Bible. 
It's written by kings, shepherds. It's written by lawyers, tax collectors. It's written from ordinary people. One guy, he was a farmer, then God called him to be a priest, and he wrote some. It spans over a period of about 1,600 years to complete it all. Somewhere around 1400 to 1500 BC, God wrote the Ten Commandments. This was the first inscribed word of God on the Ten Commandments. And he gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai. There was the first guidance of God. We heard the first words. So God gave it to Moses and then he started speaking to us. God started speaking to his people. Later, known as the Pentateuch, Moses wrote out Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. And it was recorded on animal skin that scribes called scrolls, and they would roll out the scrolls. Around 500 B.C., the 39 books that make up the Old Testament were completed, and they were preserved in Hebrew on scrolls. Sometime in the first century A.D., this is after the death of Jesus, during the first century, the New Testament was completed. And it was preserved, written in Greek, on papyrus. And papyrus is a reed-like material. It is made up of flattened and crushed um, stalks of reed. And that's what it was written on. In 393, the African Synod of Hippo officially approved the New Testament for the entire church. This is the first time there's actually going to get it in the church. By 500 AD, the Bible had been translated into 500 different languages. Around 600 AD, the Bible was restricted to only Latin. So Latin didn't come until 600 years later. All of the versions were considered illegal. This was done by the Catholic Church in Rome. And they issued a decree that any of the Bible any of the Bible is illegal, and if you were caught with an illegal Bible, you were sentenced to immediate death. Therefore, the church became corrupt. And the only person who was allowed to read the Bible was the priest. The priest would use the Bible for his own gain and deceive people. So around 400 A.D. to 1400 A.D., it was known as the Dark Ages. During this time, there was a secret society made up of what's called the Chaldees. And they continued to actually study God's Word and to teach God's Word the way it was meant to be taught, not the way the priests were doing it, for their own gain. So for 700 years, they would teach one another God's Word. There rose up a man. This is in 1380, John Wycliffe. He was the beginning of the Reformation, often referred to as the morning star of the Reformation. And what he did was is that he was the first person to translate the Bible into English. Now, this is where it gets exciting for me. Because many people go all the way back to the King James and preach King James and English and King James. But the first English translation was in 1380. We'll get to King James in a minute. Took him 10 months. Took him 10 months to translate it into English. A long time dedication. In 1415, there was a man named John Huss. And he took a bold stance on the Bible that Wycliffe created. Trying to get it into the hands of people. And he was burned at the stake. John Wycliffe's Bibles were used to start the fire that burned him at the stake. He made this statement as he was at the stake just before the fire started. And he said this. In the next 100 years, God will raise up a man whose call for reform cannot be suppressed. Most people believe that that man was Martin Luther. Because in 1517, he went and nailed his 95 thesis statement to the doors of the church in Wittenberg. Often referred to as the knock heard around the world. This was the start of the Reformation in the Protestant church. Martin Luther himself translated the Bible into German. And then he took it to the printing press. And for the first time, the Bible was actually getting to the hands of the masses instead of the few. The first 
large production of the Bible. And we are so privileged to be able to have the Bible, but they didn't then. There was an Oxford professor called John Collet, and he translated the Bible into English just for his students. He would also teach the Bible in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And he would go and they would pack this place out where 20,000 plus people would come just to hear the Word of God. They said that even more than 20,000 people were even outside just waiting to get a, a word. Just so they could hear a word from God. Now just think this was back in the 1500s. They didn't have PA systems. But yet it was said that every man heard. God's powerful. In 1526 there was a man by the name of William Tyndale. And Tyndale has a lot of Bible names. He is the first one that printed the English Bible. That actually printed it in the press. But that Bible was instantly known as illegal. And anyone caught with that Bible would be killed instantly. Before Tyndale, while he was incarcerated, he was getting ready to be strangled and burned at the stake. He prayed this prayer. Now listen, this prayer he prayed. He was getting ready to die. Here's what he said. Oh Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And in 1539, King Henry VIII finally allowed and even funded the printing of the English Bible. And this is where we get the King James 1611. All that history of the Bible to what you carry in your hands right now. Some of you have your grandmother's Bible. Some of you have your parents' Bible. Some of you have a Bible that you were given whenever you got married. Some of you went to a vacation Bible school when you were little and you were given a Bible. The Bible. Now I'm not telling you that your physical Bible is sacred, but what it represents is, it is the Word of God. And it is so powerful. And if you don't walk away with anything else from today, here's what I want you to leave with. And this is my last scripture. This is Hebrews 4.12. If you don't leave with anything today, then please leave with this. Hebrews 4.12. He says, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between the soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The reason why the Bible is so vital, so critical to the foundation of your life is because it is alive and powerful, for it is the Word of God. When you believe something, and someone asks you, why do you believe that way? You can say, for the Bible tells me so. Why do you believe a certain way? Well, my granny believed this way or, or something like that. You need to figure out what you believe and back it up with the Bible. What you believe. For this is foundational for your life is the Bible. Everything that you believe should come from the Bible. The way we believe is the reason why we vote certain ways. The way we believe guides our every action. Therefore, we should have it backed up by the Bible. It is so true, so quick, so powerful. It is alive. And for some reason, I can't explain it, but you're going through some kind of situation and dealing with a family member, dealing with a work situation, and it's just, it's amazing how this happens. But you're just like, God, I don't know where to go in the Bible. And I'll just open it up, and I'll just start reading. And some miraculous way, God starts speaking to me through His Word. That's why Hebrews 4.12 is so important because that's the way God's Word works. Because the Word of God is quick and powerful. It will reveal your thoughts unto you. It will reveal to you what you need to change in your life. It reveal to you what you need to cut out and what you need to put in. The Word of God is powerful. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like the Word of God. The Word of God. For many years, I took the Bible for granted. I counted up in my house, and just my Bibles alone, I have 12. I have 12, I have 12 Bibles. I have two that are my favorite. And yet we don't read them. It's so important, so foundational for life, but yet we don't get in it. 
Church, it's time that we get into our Bibles for it is foundational for our life. Now, you don't have to go and spend hours, but you do need to get in it. <laughs> I've said this so many times. So many people ask me, I, I would read the Bible, but I don't know where to start. I always say two things. First, read the book of John. It's all about Jesus and his love for us. And in Proverbs, there's 31 Proverbs. Read a proverb a day. From the wisest king who ever lived, King Solomon. Read it. There's amazing Proverbs. And these Proverbs are just little bits of information that will help you in your life. Start there. But church, what you need to do is take what you believe and back it up by the Bible. The Bible is true. Could you imagine what would happen if we took the Bible serious? I mean, if, if we, if us, if we took the Bible serious, if you took the Bible serious, could you imagine how that could change in your life? How that could change? Could you imagine how that would impact your family? That all your actions are coming from the Bible? That when your kids ask you questions about why you do this or, or why you don't do this, you could say, well, the Bible says it right here. This is the reason why I do that. Some of you may need a little bit of help in, in getting into your Bible. There are tons of Bible studies that you can do that will help you get into your Bible. But the point that I want you to see is that the Bible is very true, very powerful, and it will speak to you. It's not just some book. It's not something that was just old that your granny just wore out. It is so powerful. Here in just a few minutes, we're going to let... Uh, here in just a few minutes, we're going to let our kids come out and they're going to watch these baptisms take place because we think it's very important for them to see this as well. And the reason why we're practicing it is because it's in the Bible. We find it written in Acts 2.38 when Peter was addressed and everybody was wondering, well, what should we do? We, we believe in Jesus, now what should we do? And he said, then repent, turn from your ways and be baptized. We can read... Also, in the life of Jesus, that one of the first things he did whenever he came public into ministry is he was baptized. The reason why we practice that you go completely down in the water and coming back up is because the Bible says that Jesus came up out of the water. We practice as a church what we find in the Bible. Now, if you've been to Uplift for any short amount of time, and you may or may not have noticed, we don't pass an offering plate. You know why? We don't find it in the Bible. What we do find is that Jesus is making a comment about a woman who went to a giving station to give her two little half pennies. And it brought so much attention to Jesus that he called everybody's attention to it. That's the reason why we don't pass an offering plate. It's between you and God. We believe the Bible. And therefore we practice the Bible. Is what you believe, is it found in the Bible? Are you doing it all just because that's what you want to do? Or are you doing what you want to do and then hoping everything is okay? See, if we are a believer of Jesus Christ and we're, we're a follower, we believe in God, the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, then we ought to look to his instruction manual for guidance for our lives. John 3.16 tells us that God loves us so much he gave us his son. That love is written in the Bible. Now, if you are reading the Bible and you don't get anything out of it, if you find yourself that you're not looking to God's Word, then there is a problem. One, either you don't know Him. What Tony was talking about earlier in his introduction, you're not saved. You don't know Him. You do not have a relationship with Him. So therefore, when you try to go to church or you're trying to read the Bible, it's almost like somebody's taking their fingernails and scratching it on a chalkboard. And you're not getting anything out of it. Do you know God? Because if you do, then it's time to get in God's Word. If you don't, maybe God is speaking to you right now and say, Listen, the Bible is true and it's time for you to be saved. Maybe you are saved and you're not in the Bible because... It just doesn't, you're not getting anything out of it or you're just not taking the time to do it. Then it's time that you do that, that you hit the Bible. Man, they are excited back there in preteen. Uh, it's time that you get in the Bible. Get in the Bible. Get in the Bible. Don't say it's not alive. Don't, don't say it's, it's boring. 
get in it. I promise that if you get in it, it will speak to you no matter what's going on in your life. Just get in it. How are things between you and God right now? When you look at your Bible, do you see an old book? Or do you see the Word of God? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and let's pray together right now. Father, I pray right now that you would speak ever so clearly. And that as you reveal yourself in us through the power of your Holy Spirit, God, we will know exactly what it is you would have us to do. Right now, as you continue to pray, there's some of you that you need to step up your personal relationship with God. That you need to get in God's Word. That you need to hear. You need to read what God's Word says about you and your actions in your future. If that's you, then I want to pray for you. That you would take the Bible uh, even more serious than what you already do. That you would get in it and discover God's deepest riches. I want to pray for you. If that's you today, you recognize, yes, that's me. I want to pray for you. I need to get in God's Word. I want to pray for you. Hands are already going up. I, need, I want to pray for you. Hands are still going up. Thank you. I need to get in God's Word. I just need to get in it. God, I pray that you would speak to us as we dive into your word, reveal yourself unto us. God, may we be moved through the power of your Holy Spirit because you are at work. God, your word is so quick, it's so powerful, it's so true, and may it continue to speak to us today. There's others of you that maybe, that maybe you're not into the Bible because you don't understand it. That I encourage you to find a Bible that speaks to you and just get in it. Some of you, the reason why you've not is because you've been hurt before. And I encourage you, I beg you, to open it up one more time. There's others of you here today, and maybe you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe at one time, maybe you were baptized, or maybe at one time that you, you said you were saved, but your actions are so far from it, and your actions all take place because of what you truly believe what do you believe right now do you believe in God the Father do you believe that God sent his son to die for you right now if God's speaking to your heart and says listen I'm knocking at your heart and it's time for you to be saved it's time for you to accept Jesus then I encourage you right now to call it on God nobody's looking around this is between you and God just call it on God right now and say God I want you to save me Save me. I need Jesus. I accept Him as my Savior for my sins. I believe that He died and rose again for me. Now take my life, God, and make me brand new. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. If you prayed up prior today, would you just slip your hand up that I may pray for you? If you prayed up prior today to receive Jesus, may I pray for you? Father, I pray that you continue to move and work in our lives and that we would never forget what you've done and all that you're going to do. I pray, Father, right now that you would be very present in our lives and that as you continue to move and work and as we get into your word, oh God, how alive it will become. Father, we're getting ready to do baptisms. I pray for those that are being baptized and all of us that are about to witness this. May your Holy Spirit come unleashed and may we see your full glory. As you look down upon Uplift Church today, Father, may you be pleased and honored through all that you see. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you give God some praise this morning? He's absolutely awesome. Thank you, God, so very much.